I swiftly removed the bedding, maneuvered the mattress off the queen-size frame, and half lifted, half slid it downstairs, through the hallway, out the front door, and onto the lawn by the street. Returning inside, I tossed the slats and bedclothes downstairs, followed them outside, and added them to the pile beside the mattress. After another trip upstairs, I dismantled the side rails and swiftly transported them outside. Glancing at my watch, I saw it was 5.25. Time was crucial. I needed to finish by 6. Reassembling the bed took until 5.37. The kitchen table, light enough for me to handle alone, I angled sideways through the door and placed it beside the bed in the yard. The last item was the 5x9 fro rug in the living room. After rolling it up, I joined it with the other items in the yard. Erecting the signs, I proudly observed the time. 5.53, just seven minutes until my wife's return. Stepping into the middle of the street, I surveyed my handiwork. It was a sight to behold almost. It brought a tear to my eye, seeing our marriage bed, the kitchen table, and the throw rug. Three places I knew had been tainted by my wife and her lover repeatedly over the past six months. The signs, perfectly positioned and out of reach, completed the scene. Approaching each piece of furniture, I read aloud the large sign placed in front of it. These items are yours for the taking free. They are no longer wanted in this house. If you can bear the stench of infidelity and broken vows, help yourself. Above the bed, a detailed account of my wife's infidelity was laid out, specifying her regular liaisons with her lover over the past six months. Above the kitchen table, another sign recounted their activities, typically just before she served me dinner on the throw rug a sign indicating their preference for that spot. Each sign was adorned with a 16 by 24 inch photo capturing the adulterous couple in the act. Behind the table, a fifth sign revealed the identity of my wife's lover, Logan White, her boss at Anderson Price. The time was 5.58, just in time. She would be home any minute. As I turned to survey the growing crowd of neighbors and the increasing number of halted cars, some onlookers began phoning friends or the police. I casually acknowledged the gathering and retreated into the house, closing the door precisely at 6 o'clock p.m. My wife's car rounded the corner just then, and she slowed down, noticing the commotion near our house. Her gaze fixed on the unfolding spectacle on our lawn. I imagined her focusing on the furniture and signs, especially the large photos depicting her and Logan White engaged in their illicit activities. Moments of lust and pleasure frozen in time. Even with her car window separating us amidst the crowd of 20 or 30 onlookers, I still heard her desperate cry. No. Oh God. No. Finally. Her gaze shifted from the signs to the front window of our house, where she spotted me standing. We locked eyes, and she appeared devastated. Her complexion drained, tears streaming down her cheeks. It seemed as if she was questioning me, mirroring my own bewilderment. I observed her for a moment before turning away, drawing the curtain shut behind me. Perhaps now is the moment to recount the events that led my wife, Rachel, and me to this tragic juncture. My name is Dylan Thomas, and I encountered Rachel during my junior year of college, introduced by a mutual acquaintance. I was immediately entranced. Rachel's beauty was not conventional, but she possessed an irresistible charm. Standing at five foot two, with striking blue eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair, she boasted a petite yet perfectly proportioned figure that mesmerized me. From that instant, I was captivated. Without a shred of doubt in my mind regarding my ability to win her heart, Rachel, and I swiftly embarked on a relationship, becoming inseparable within a month. Our first intimate encounter was unlike any other, an experience that consumed me with love. However, my adoration for Rachel was insatiable. Our passion for each other was overwhelming. Every moment spent together was blissful, every touch electric. Over the years, our love only deepened. After graduating, we tied the knot and settled into our first home. Rachel pursued a career in real estate, while I found employment in electronic manufacturing. For the next 12 years, we built what I considered to be a perfect life together. We once shared an idyllic life, first in our condo, and later in our dream home 
as our financial situation improved. With the arrival of our children, Alice, now eight, and Jacob, six, whom we adored beyond measure, our family became our entire world. So, what caused this apparent perfect picture to shatter? I wish I had the answers. I wish I had noticed the subtle signs hinting that something was amiss. But I was oblivious, living in a bubble of love and trust. It took an unexpected event, our daughter Alice, falling ill at school, to unveil the truth. It was a Thursday when I received the call from the school nurse just before noon, informing me of Alice's illness. Amidst the staff meeting, I requested the nurse to contact my wife. Despite attempts to reach her at her office and on her cell, she was unreachable. So the responsibility fell upon me. Recognizing the urgency of fetching my daughter, I apologized to my staff and hurried to Alice's school to retrieve her. Upon arriving home and opening the garage, I was taken aback by an unfamiliar car parked in my spot beside my wife's. Instantly, a lump formed in my throat and my stomach churned. No, it couldn't be. I reassured myself that my wife, the woman I cherished above all else, couldn't possibly be having an affair. But why was there a strange car in the garage? With the door closed, something felt off, and I needed answers. I couldn't subject my daughter to this uncertainty. Instructing Alice to remain in the car for a moment, I explained that the exterminator was spraying for bugs and the fumes could make her feel worse. It was the first time I had ever lied to her. Alice complained of tiredness and expressed a desire to go inside. But I assured her that I would check first before coming to fetch her later. When Alice asked what was happening, I reassured her that everything was fine, attributing my discomfort to the odor in the house. I left Alice with her grandmother, promising to return for her in a couple of hours. I didn't divulge what I had witnessed, simply asking my mom to look after Alice until I returned from work. Despite the temptation to go back home and confront the cheating couple, I realized that I needed more than just a confrontation. I craved revenge. As I drove back to my office, I began devising plans that would bring ruin upon my wife and her boss. At the electronics firm where I worked, there were multiple divisions. Being a senior engineer in the medical equipment division, we shared a sizable complex with another division specializing in commercial security equipment. Upon reaching my office, I instructed my secretary to ensure I wouldn't be disturbed for the rest of the afternoon. Then I called my counterpart in the security division, Aidan Jackson, who was not only a stellar engineer, but also a longtime friend, and he agreed to meet promptly. Aidan mentioned he'd already be heading my way to drop off some blueprints for copying. I informed my secretary that Aidan could enter my office. True to his word, Aidan knocked on my door just 25 minutes later. I asked him to come in and close the door, explaining that I needed his assistance. Observing my distressed state, Aidan remarked that I looked like I had seen a ghost. In response, I recounted the shocking discovery I had made earlier. I explained to Aidan how I had caught my wife and her boss having an affair in our house, specifically in our bedroom. Despite his disbelief, I assured him that it was true, detailing how I found them together. When I arrived home to pick up my daughter from school, I made a conscious decision not to confront them immediately. Instead, I prioritized my daughter's well-being, asking her to wait in the car while I quietly escorted her to my mom's house. Aiden expressed his sympathy and inquired about my plans moving forward. Admitting my uncertainty, I emphasized the necessity of gathering evidence and mentioned my intention to collect audio and video recordings of their encounters. Seeking Aiden's assistance, I asked for help in obtaining security cameras and microphones to discreetly place around the house. Aiden questioned the likelihood of a repeat occurrence, suggesting that the incident might have been a one-time occurrence. However, I dismissed this notion citing conversations between my wife and her boss regarding regular rendezvous over the past five months. I explained my rationale, pointing out the absence of alternative locations and the convenience of my empty house during work hours. After a few more minutes of discussion, we delved into the specifics. I didn't mention having access to a new better line of wireless miniature cameras and microphones that were compatible with my laptop or home computer. Additionally, he had a small voice-activated recorder 
that I could discreetly place under Rachel's car seat to capture any conversations she might have while driving. While it would only record her side of the conversation, it was better than nothing. I expressed gratitude to Aiden and informed him that I would collect everything from his office the following day. Returning home, that evening proved to be the most challenging task I ever faced. Unsure if I could face my wife and pretend nothing had happened, I decided the best course of action was to make Rachel believe I wasn't feeling well, which was true. After retrieving Alice from my mom's upon arriving home, I found Rachel preparing dinner in the kitchen. Upon seeing Alice with me, Rachel grew frantic. I questioned her about her whereabouts and why she hadn't informed me about Alice's illness, mentioning that I had received a message from the school nurse on the answering machine. Rachel explained that she must have accidentally turned off her phone while showing houses and had been busy all day. Cynically, I couldn't help but think she was likely preoccupied with her affairs with her boss instead of attending to our daughter. Despite this, Rachel hugged Alice and apologized before helping her to bed. I acknowledged that, despite her flaws, my wife did love our kids, and it seemed I was the obstacle to her happiness. Rachel then returned to the kitchen to prepare soup for Alice and finish dinner for the rest of us, feeling unwell myself. I informed Rachel that I would sleep in the guest room that night, just in case I was contagious. She silently acknowledged my clowny appearance and pale complexion. I couldn't help but recognize the irony of feeling unwell after discovering my wife's affair. Without waiting for a response, I made my way upstairs, initially dreading entering the master suite, but knowing I needed my grooming supplies, toothbrush, and work attire for the next day. So I forced myself into the room. A window was open, and the lingering scent of lovemaking had dissipated. The bed was neatly made, she must have changed the sheets. It pained me to look at it, envisioning her boss making love to her, whispering sweet nothings about belonging to him alone forever. Anger surged within me, that I suppressed it. I needed to remain composed until I could unleash havoc upon them both, and I would, that much was certain. Gathering my necessities, I retreated to the guest bedroom, shutting the door behind me. Stripping down to my underwear, I slipped into bed. My body felt tense, and the urge to weep threatened to overwhelm me, but I stifled it. I had a mission to accomplish, and I couldn't allow emotions to interfere. For hours, I lay in the darkness, sleep evading me, tending to the kids and putting them to bed weighing heavily on my mind. My wife entered the room, and I feigned sleep as she pressed her palm against my forehead before quietly leaving and shutting the door behind her. Rachel typically handled taking the kids to school, so I rose early, showered, and left the house before her awakening. It might have struck her as odd, but I could easily attribute it to needing to catch up on lost time from yesterday when I wasn't feeling well. Frankly, I didn't care much about her opinion. At this point, all I wanted was to be free from what, until yesterday, I believed was a blissful marriage founded on lifelong loyalty, honesty, and commitment. How painfully mistaken I was. Arriving at work before the rest of the staff, I brewed a pot of coffee and began outlining my strategies. I realized I needed to cancel our shared credit cards, transfer half of our joint accounts to a separate bank under my sole name, and change my will, life insurance, and beneficiaries, deleting Rachel and naming only Alice and Jacob. It all seemed like such a trifling attempt to dissolve the last 12 years of my life. It was supposed to feel more serious. In the back of my mind, I suspected it would get more complicated at some point. I'd also recognized the importance of securing a competent divorce attorney to safeguard myself from any potential exploitation by Rachel. Residing in a no-fault divorce state meant that infidelity wouldn't significantly impact the financial settlement, but it could potentially influence the custody arrangements for my children. Despite Rachel demonstrating my insignificance in her life, she remained a devoted mother, and I had no intention of depriving her of her children. My aim was simple to secure joint custody to ensure that I remained a significant presence in their lives. I struggled to suppress memories of our life together and the humiliation of overhearing my wife praising her lover's superiority to me in every aspect. Allowing myself to dwell on such thoughts would only lead to self-doubt, a luxury I couldn't afford at the moment. That reckoning would come later, 
and when it did, it would likely devastate me. With my to-do list complete, I could begin to face whatever lay ahead. I called Aiden's office, and he assured me that everything would be ready by noon, and offered his assistance in installing and operating the equipment. As I tried to focus on clearing paperwork from my desk, I noticed Rachel's call on my cell phone. Despite her usually affectionate tone, her voice only fueled my anger. This time, Rachel expressed concern about my well-being, mentioning that she hadn't been able to check on me before I left that morning. I responded vaguely, stating that I needed to clear my head. She suggested an idea to make me feel better that evening. But internally, I couldn't help feeling resentful and deceived by her lies. However, I kept my response neutral, indicating that we would see. Rachel commented on my apparent lack of interest, to which I replied that I was preoccupied rather than uninterested. We agreed to meet at home by 6.30, and she reassured me that she would be in the office all day if I needed to reach her. I called Aiden, who confirmed that everything was prepared, instructing me to meet him at the loading dock entrance. We loaded all the equipment into Aiden's van, and with both of us working on the installation, we had everything set up and tested by 4.15. Then, we installed the software on my home office PC and configured a secure folder to collect and store everything captured by the cameras and microphones. We strategically placed bugs in the living room, kitchen, guest bedroom, and notably the master suite, ensuring each location had four cameras to capture nearly every activity. As an additional measure, we installed a camera and microphone in the master bathroom, just in case the couple decided to shower together after their encounter. The system was motion activated with the cameras triggering the microphones. I was prepared. That night was exceptionally challenging for me after dinner. Once the kids were asleep, I followed my wife to our bedroom. I turned away from her and pretended to fall asleep. Rachel noticed the change in our usual routine and asked if everything was all right. I expressed some insecurities about whether I was enough for her, to which she reassured me that I was more than enough. She emphasized that she couldn't bear anything happening to me and that I was her perfect lover. Despite her reassurances, I remained distant and brushed off her concern, stating that nothing was bothering me. Exhaustion overtook me and I closed my eyes attempting to sleep. Later, I heard Rachel softly crying. I felt no sympathy for her, but I pondered whether her tears stemmed from shame for her actions or from feeling mistreated by me. Once again, I rose before her and seized the chance to place the voice recorder beneath the seat of her car. I also reviewed the video and audio recordings from the installed equipment, confirming that everything from the previous night was captured clearly, even in the dim nighttime conditions of our bedroom. Initially, Rachel was a bit curt, mentioning that I had said some hurtful things the night before. Then, she gave me a quick kiss on the cheek, and her demeanor shifted to cheerful. Perhaps it was due to her afternoon plans with her boss. I poured her a cup of coffee and informed her that I'd be locked in my office all day. She mentioned having to show several homes that afternoon and expressed confidence in making a significant sale, but assured me she'd be able to pick up Alice and Jacob after school with a peck on her cheek. Heading towards the garage door, Rachel reminded me that I had forgotten to say I love you. She emphasized the importance of hearing those words from me every morning. I apologized, explaining that there was a lot on my mind, but Rachel insisted it was crucial for her to hear them. I promised not to forget in the future, and with that, I left, though eternally I scoffed at the idea of expressing love to someone else. If and when I ever found another girl, I could trust enough to fall in love with. Rachel's plans about showing homes all afternoon led me to believe she'd probably be with her true love. I hoped so. I was tired of games and wanted this ordeal done. I spent the morning working in my office but kept glancing at my watch. Finally, at noon, I informed my secretary that I'd be gone for a few hours and put my plan in motion. Borrowing a company van, I parked across from my house, waiting to see what would unfold. It wasn't until nearly two o'clock that I saw Rachel's car arrive, open the garage door and park in her usual spot. When she entered the house without closing the garage, I suspected she was either leaving again or expecting someone. Fifteen minutes later, 
It became evident she was expecting someone as the same car from the day before pulled into the garage. I caught them red-handed as they entered the house, taking my place, just as he had taken my place in my wife's life. I watched him get out of the car, and the garage door closed. I had to give it to them, the nerve to meet in my house in my bed to carry out their affair. It just proved they thought they wouldn't get caught or didn't care. Well, it'd soon find out they were wrong. They were caught, and I'd make sure they both cared with this final proof of my wife's infidelity. Knowing I'd soon have all the visual evidence I needed of their affair, I finally let the tears fall after 12 years. I was convinced my loving wife would never cheat on me, just as I'd never cheat on her. Doubts crept in. Was he a better lover? Maybe better looking, but neither of us was exceptional. Why risk our marriages? I desperately wanted to confront them, but what would achieve? I'd catch them, but I'd already done that once. Would I feel better by confronting her lover? Yes, but I'd likely end up in jail by this time. Neither of them were worth it. My only worry was how this would affect my kids and his. I was prepared to confront him, just as he had confronted me. By 3.40, they must have finished, as the garage door opened and he left. Ten minutes later, my wife did the same, closing the garage door behind her. I knew she'd return home with the kids by 4.20, so I quickly parked in the garage and made my way to my home office. I didn't want to review all the footage, just ensure the evidence was safely on my hard drive. After 15 minutes, I'd had my fill. It wasn't an exact replay of their previous encounter. Love making on the kitchen table where I'd eat. They joked about how many times they wondered if I'd ever realize I was dining where he had been intimate with her so often. Then they moved to our bedroom, though not before her lover suggested using my daughter's room for a change of scenery. My wife adamantly refused, stating it was off limits to involve their kids' rooms. At least she seemed to have some principles, just not concerning me in the bedroom. They resumed their activities. I noticed neither of them expressed love, but my wife continued to praise her boss as the best lover she'd ever had. However, I couldn't comprehend why. They then moved to the throw rug by the living room fireplace, where they engaged once more. When finished, I found it strange that she didn't bother changing the sheets, assuming she would do so. When she returned with the kids at 4.25, this gave her plenty of time to air out the room and remove any evidence, since I rarely arrived home before 6 and had secured the evidence I needed on my hard drive. I shut down the system and left the house without bothering to check the assumed mess on our marriage bed. I'd seen enough, and although my heart was hardened against my wife, I still felt sick inside. A sickness soon replaced by burning anger and hatred. I may have even smiled, knowing the hell I was about to unleash on their cheating heads. Back at work, I briefed Aiden on everything, trying to comprehend how a supposedly loving wife like Rachel could do such a thing. What was now clear? Not only did she break our sacred vows, but she also went out of her way to humiliate me to her lover, always affirming his superiority. All these thoughts plunged my soul into a deep abyss of pain and despair, from which I knew I had to emerge to complete my task of destroying them both. I needed to find a good divorce lawyer, and Aiden suggested contacting the law firm the company used for recommendations. I spoke to a corporate lawyer there who gave me three names of divorce lawyers known for protecting husbands' rights. The first one was retiring and not taking new clients, but the second one agreed to meet me the next afternoon at 2.30. With that settled, I resolved to handle cancelling credit cards, changing beneficiaries, and transferring funds. The following evening when I arrived home, Rachel was in the kitchen, preparing dinner, while the kids worked on their homework in their rooms. She wore a yellow sundress and looked stunning, causing a pang in my heart. She seemed so happy, her usual post-afternoon delight mood. She greeted me warmly and asked about my day, mentioning her own happiness due to making a sale. I responded with mild interest, though aware of the underlying reason for her joy. I inquired if anything else notable happened that day or if she met any interesting people, to which she denied, stating her focus was solely on work and returning home to her family. Despite her reassurance, I couldn't shake the suspicion of her affair. 
As I headed upstairs to change clothes, I noticed the sheets had been replaced and the room aired out. Upon returning to the kitchen, I casually mentioned the water on the shower floor and asked if she had showered that afternoon. She seemed startled and denied it, suggesting a possible clogged drain. I speculated about the possibility of someone sneaking into the house for a rendezvous and showering afterward, which seemed to unsettle her. She attempted to brush it off with humour, but as dinner progressed, conversation was minimal. I surprised Rachel by switching seats with her, prompting her to question the change. I explained it as a desire for a change of scenery. She appeared puzzled and ate little, mainly moving food around on her plate. During dinner, the kids talked about their day, but Rachel and I mostly listened, making occasional comments. After we all helped clean the dishes, I returned to my office to work on my project. I reviewed footage from that day and selected suitable stills to turn into photographs, which I downloaded to a photo file for printing. Next, I carefully crafted wording for the signs I would create with the photographs. All that remained was to visit my lawyer to initiate the divorce, get my finances in order, and await the next visit from my wife and her lover. When I finally went to bed that night, Rachel was already asleep, or at least pretending to be. I was fairly certain my actions that evening had given her something to ponder. Not that it mattered. There was nothing she could say or do to change my mind about divorcing her for her infidelity. And there was a small silver lining in the fact that I believed I'd managed to make her at least somewhat uneasy. Today was Tuesday and Rachel had mentioned making another sale on Thursday. So I took that as a signal that she and her lover would be meeting on that day. That would also mark the day I brought them down the following morning. I rose early once again, showered, and left before Rachel woke up. I had a lot to accomplish, and wanted to allocate as much time as possible to get it done. My lawyer appointment wasn't until two o'clock, so I had plenty of time to handle all the financial matters. I visited HR, where I changed the beneficiary on my life insurance from Rachel to Alice and Jacob. I received some odd looks from the woman assisting me, but I didn't feel obligated to explain my actions to her or anyone else. Next, I cancelled all our joint credit cards and obtained new ones in my name alone. Then I proceeded to the bank where I transferred half of the funds from our joint checking and savings accounts to another bank in my name. I knew I needed to address our home, but I presumed the courts would allow Rachel to stay there with the kids. So I postponed action on that front until I consulted with my lawyer at two o'clock. I met with my lawyer, finding him to be agreeable enough. He cautioned me that, since we were in a no-fault state, Rachel would likely get custody of Alice and Jacob, and I'd lose the house and half of everything else in her wife, even with proof of her infidelity. I instructed him on how I wanted the petition written. When he expressed doubt about my chances of taking nearly everything from her, I reassured him I was confident I could persuade her to agree to whatever I wanted. He wasn't pleased, but he complied with my demands assuring me he would have everything prepared for her to be served Friday morning. I also had him draft papers to file against her boss and his company for intentionally wrecking my marriage. Those documents would also be ready by Friday morning. I was prepared when I returned home that evening. I kept my demeanor cool toward Rachel. Frankly, I had reached my limit and just wanted the whole ordeal to end so I could move on with my life. I knew there was still a lot of pain and heartache ahead, but I acknowledged there was no turning back. After a subdued dinner with minimal conversation, I retired to my study. There I printed the photos of the lovers I intended to use and crafted the signs without interruption. I also found time to compose a letter to Logan White's wife, enclosing prints of the large photos I planned to use on the posters. I informed her that I had plenty of video evidence to provide her in case she decided to divorce her husband, as I was divorcing mine. Shortly after 10.30, I went to our bedroom to ensure Rachel was asleep, then made my way to her car to retrieve the voice-activated recorder from beneath her seat. I rewound it and listened to its contents. I overheard one side of a conversation that sounded like it was with Logan. The caller expressed gratitude for their time together that afternoon and mentioned missing Logan. After they were together, they discussed the idea of spending a whole week together and fabricating a story about a real estate convention they must attend. 
the caller mentioned having to give Dylan occasional attention to keep him happy, but expressed a desire to be exclusively with Logan. They confirmed plans for Thursday afternoon and ended the call. I was taken aback to discover that her words didn't sting as much as they had in the past. Perhaps there was still hope for me after all. Little did she realize how soon she would belong solely to him forever. The knowledge that I was just one day away from dismantling their comfortable lives filled me with a sense of satisfaction. Revenge, I was realizing, wielded formidable power. I swapped out the tape with a fresh one and returned the recorder under her seat, hoping it would capture evidence of her anguish. The next day, when her world crumbled, I hardly slept a wink that night. Not because I was heartbroken. I had surpassed that. No, my sleeplessness stemmed from the anticipation of everything I hoped would unfold the following day. For the last time, I rose from bed while Rachel continued to slumber. I stood gazing at the woman who had once been my love, the mother of my children. Tears welled in my eyes as I realized I had shared my bed with her for the final time. Never again would our bodies entwine in passion. Never again would we cuddle or discuss our future. Our future was non-existent. And as I turned away from her and departed, I pondered whether she comprehended the toll she was about to pay for betraying me. She likely didn't, but she would soon learn. After showering, I left the house, stopped for breakfast at a diner, and briefly swung by work to inform my secretary of my absence for the day. I phoned Aiden and briefed him on the impending events. He wished me luck, cautioned me to be cautious, and requested that I keep him updated on the proceedings. I made a brief visit to my lawyer's office to ensure all was in order for serving my wife and Logan White the following day. Following that, I called my wife to arrange picking up the kids from school. My mother had expressed a desire to have them for the long weekends since they had no school on Friday. Thus, I planned to swing by the house around 1.35 p.m. to gather some belongings and transport the kids directly to my mom's. She enthusiastically approved, even suggesting we spend Saturday in bed together in her most seductive turn. I agreed nonchalantly before ending the call. I had reached a point where I couldn't tolerate her deceit any longer. Taking my time, I returned home by 1.35 p.m. and parked nearby, waiting the imminent events. My car was mostly concealed from view, but I had a clear line of sight to any vehicle entering my driveway. I didn't need to witness the garage door's movements. My wife and her lover were nothing if not predictable, and I was familiar with their routine. At 1.55 p.m., Rachel's car rolled into the driveway, followed five minutes later by Logan White. The trap was set, and I was poised to ensnare them. While I waited around the corner for them to finish, I should have felt anguish, knowing my wife and her boss were engaging in pleasure in our marital bed. Yet, she had lost her ability to inflict pain upon me. Composed, I felt detached as I envisioned the activities I knew they were engaging in together. It was almost reminiscent of recalling a low-budget adult film, lacking in substance, but with a satisfying conclusion. Around 2.55 p.m., I observed White's car reverse out of the driveway and depart five minutes later. Rachel followed suit. As she drove off, I observed her applying fresh lipstick. Once they were out of sight, I pulled into my garage and shut the door with limited time on my hands. I headed to my office and reviewed the footage from that afternoon's encounter. Everything was captured, including the hurtful insults about his superiority in bed compared to me. However, this time, their words didn't affect me. After ensuring the footage was securely stored on my hard drive. For the next 15 minutes, I carried my handcrafted signs, adorned with their photographs, upstairs and positioned them near the front door for easy access. Then, I packed essentials like a toothbrush and clothes for Alice and Jacob into my car. The only remorse I felt about my impending actions was for the pain I was about to inflict on my beloved children. Yet, I found solace in knowing I hadn't caused the pain of their parents' separation. That responsibility rested solely on their mother's shoulders. She chose to engage in a prolonged affair, ultimately tearing our family apart. At 3.35, I drove to their school and was waiting when the final bell rang to pick them up. I informed them they'd spend the weekend with Grandma, which thrilled them given her penchant for spoiling them. 
40 minutes later, I dropped them off and returned home, ready to set my plan in motion. And thus, we come full circle to where we began. The bed table and row displayed on the lawn, adorned with signs, watched by neighbours, awaiting Rachel's return to the dreadful truth that I held all the knowledge. That night, I expected to hear from Rachel, but I didn't. There was a late call from her cell phone. When I answered, silence greeted me. An hour after Rachel departed, the police paid me a visit, understandingly insisting that I remove the signs and photographs to avoid disturbing the peace and facing public indecency charges. Reluctantly, I complied. They had served their purpose, seen by my wife, and from the look on her face before I turned away, I knew her life had begun its descent into chaos that evening. I drowned my sorrows in a substantial amount of Maker's Mark and drifted into an alcoholic stupor. Friday morning greeted me with a monstrous hangover. Yet, despite it, I felt empowered, though saddened and alone. I found strength in knowing I had subdued my anger long enough to exact revenge on my unfaithful wife and her lover. By noon, I glanced out the front window to find the rug, kitchen table and bed gone, leaving only the mattress and stained sheets behind. I planned to dispose of those later. The morning passed uneventfully, but by three in the afternoon, chaos erupted. I was certain that Logan White's wife had received the letter and photographs that morning, and my lawyer had informed me that both Rachel and Logan White, along with his partners, had been served at their workplaces. He recounted how Rachel collapsed in tears upon being served, while Logan White disregarded her, unleashing threats against me. After his partners were treated behind closed doors for 20 minutes, they emerged to present Rachel with her final check and inform Logan that his partnership was terminated. When he refused to sell to them, they cited their corporate bylaws, specifically the morality clause regarding romantic involvement with staff members. This provision empowered them to sever all ties with him and his mistress concurrently. The receptionist at the front desk relayed that his wife was on the phone, urgently requesting to speak with him. She had received the letter and photos I had sent, informing her not to return home and notifying her of my intent to file for divorce. Later that day, I was informed by one of the agency employee's husbands that after White was escorted out of the building, everyone turned their backs on my soon-to-be ex-wife. She remained on the floor for about 40 minutes, crying inconsolably. Eventually, she gathered herself enough to leave, though no one knew her whereabouts. The next day, Rachel finally called me, sounding distraught. She inquired about the children and whether they knew about the situation. I assured her they were safe at my mother's and wouldn't hear the details from me. She thanked me for my discretion and asked to retrieve some belongings, to which I agreed, offering to leave for a few hours. She requested to stay and talk, but I declined, leading to more tears from her. She pleaded for my understanding, expressing remorse and claiming she never intended to hurt me. I laughed at her apology, questioning how she could claim innocence. I accused her of betraying me with her words to him, mentioning that I had recordings of her confessing these feelings. Despite her denial, I insisted that her words were recorded and nothing she said could change how I felt about her. She professed her love for me, claiming she had always loved only me and didn't understand why she said those things to Logan. She explained that she had done it to boost his ego because he complained about his wife. I questioned her explanation, pointing out that she had torn me down to him and had been involved with him intimately for six months. She insisted she never meant to hurt me and didn't mean any of it. When I pressed her for an explanation, she admitted that it felt dirty with Logan and she felt that she should keep it separate from what she had with me, which she described as loving and clean. I expressed disbelief at her actions and called her sick, admitting my own foolishness for not seeing it sooner. She begged for a chance to make it right, insisting that she loved only me and belonged to me. She pleaded for forgiveness and offered to come to me immediately, begging me not to leave her. I informed Rachel that I no longer loved her and that she was the one who had left me. I condemned her actions with Logan over the past six months, stating that her behavior proved she didn't love me. I expressed disgust towards her and eagerly awaited her departure from my life. 
I rejected any possibility of reconciliation, expressing my disdain for her. After what she had done with Logan, I emphasized that any future interaction would only be for the sake of our children, whom she had also damaged. I explained that while I wanted to spare our children pain, I had no intention of sparing her any consequences for her actions. I wanted her to feel the same pain she had caused me and Logan's wife. When she questioned why I told Logan's wife about their affair, I retorted that what she and Logan did was unfair to me and our children. I justified informing Logan's wife by highlighting the destruction of my family, the betrayal of our marital vows, and the need for Logan's wife to know the truth. Rachel expressed her desire to fight for our marriage, stating that she didn't want a divorce. I responded by saying there was nothing left to fight for, and that I would rather die than remain married to her. I accused her of being delusional and out of her mind. She urged me to read the divorce petition she served me with, claiming that if I agreed to joint custody for our children, I could stay in the house and receive half of our assets. However, she threatened to share the videos of her affair if I didn't agree to her terms. When I doubted her willingness to follow through with the threat, she insisted that she could and would do it out of hatred towards me. She pleaded with me to sign the divorce papers, but I remained firm in my decision. In the end, she begged me to sign the papers, but I refused, insisting that she should sign them instead. After hanging up on her, Rachel signed the divorce papers, and the divorce was finalized in six months. She now lives with Alice and Jacob in our former home, while I reside in a nearby condo. Despite the divorce, we remained in the same school district to minimize disruption for the kids. Although they still felt the pain of the breakup, Alice disclosed that their mother acknowledged her mistake, accepting that our marriage couldn't overcome it. However, we reassured the kids that we would always be there for them. As for what Rachel told her parents and sister about the breakup, I'm uncertain, but they still communicate with me, indicating she likely didn't place blame solely on me. My mother perceived the divorce as something neither Rachel nor I could move past. I had the chance to retrieve the audio recorder from Rachel's car on last time, capturing a memorable conversation. She called Logan and thanked him for their time together, expressing concern about my suspicions and suggesting they pause their affair temporarily. Upon arriving home, she discovered signs and photographs, revealing my knowledge of her infidelity, leading to her panic and realization of the consequences. She called Logan in distress, informing him that I knew everything about their affair and broke down into tears. It's been over a year since we weathered those turbulent times and gradually, I'm starting to put things back together. I still avoid dating and likely will for some time. The thought of reliving what I've just endured makes me cautious about jumping into another serious relationship. Alice mentioned that her mom went on one date but returned home in tears and as far as she knows, hasn't dated since. Rachel found work as a receptionist in a retirement village and has put her real estate career on hold, at least for now. I've never found out if she keeps in touch with Logan White, and frankly, I don't care. Logan White and his wife divorced, and he's been struggling to find employment. Even though I didn't share the videos of their intimate encounters with anyone Rachel knew, I have no sympathy for Logan. It seems many businesses are hesitant to hire someone with a reputation for seducing married women and causing marriages to dissolve. Although I blurred Rachel's face in the videos, I retained all the audio. I recently heard that Logan's ex-wife is dating a county police officer, and it appears to be serious. Good for her. Speaking of Logan's former employer, to avoid negative publicity, they offered me a generous settlement to prevent a lawsuit. I accepted it. As far as I'm concerned, that chapter is closed for now. My focus is solely on my children and their future. Perhaps one day, my own future will take precedence as well. Dear listeners, please share what you think about this story in the comments.